Aber jetzt wollen wir uns erstmal ein bisschen noch mit dem immateriellen Erbe dieses Ortes hier beschäftigen. Wir werden das Gespräch auf Englisch führen. Ähm, vielleicht muss ich ab und zu ein Wort fragen, dann müsst ihr mir helfen, was das auf Englisch heißen könnte. Äh, wir werden nicht übersetzen. Ich hoffe, Sie kommen alle zurecht, sonst setzen Sie sich neben jemanden, der Englisch kann und Ihnen ein bisschen erklären kann. Ähm, aber wir werden versuchen, ähm, das im, in einem leichten Englisch zu sagen. In Israel sagt man Beivrit Kala, also einem einfachen Hebräisch. So we will have um, Anglit Kala. Okay. <lacht> Yeah, I'm Sarah Susan from the Jewish Museum. I'm a curator for, for contemporary uh, Jewish cultures. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here on the panel today with this three lovely, lovely people. Um, and uh, during our panel, I will introduce them also to you. But first, maybe we should start um, yeah, to get clear what we are doing on this panel tonight. So we have in the program announcement, we have words like entangible heritage, we have words like Jewish renaissance, we are to question if there are traces still present, and we have to ask ourselves if we have, uh, or if these traces have an impact on today. But we also, since we have two artists with us on the panel, we have to ask, how do we approach this place artistically? And we saw during the event of the last days that there was a lot of art in it. And in the end, maybe, we can also ask the question, is if there is a form of Jewish revival in Frankfurt and in Germany? I don't know. So the people. We have Dr. Rachel Heuberger. She is um, a grand dame. She is our fact sheet of tonight. Um, she's an historian. She's the chairwoman of the local council and school board of the Jewish community. She's the former head of the Judaica department of the university library. And she will, have us, she will uh, tell us a lot about this Jewish Renaissance. We have Ariel Ashbel. Many of, of you maybe um, met him today and during the other days. Um, he's an artist. He graduated from different schools of visual theater in Jerusalem and from Tel Aviv University in history and philosophy. He is doing theater, fine arts, dance, music, installation. He's a performance artist, as we learned today. He's living in Berlin. But his connection to Frankfurt, you saw maybe on the video screen here, is his Bar Mitzvah project. Maybe we will hear more about that. And we have Ethan Braun. Ethan Braun is a um, composer, also an artist. Maybe sound art is his subject. He studied in the University of Los Angeles, right? Peabody and The Hague, and completing his studies at Yale University. So we have a lot of university around you. Your concert music has been performed in many places, in the States, in Europe, in Argentina, in China. Um, and we also could listen to your composition, to your sound installation uh, on the first night of our event here. So you see, we are a very interesting constellation to deal with these questions we are supposed to deal with. And we try to approach this place. So Rachel, the Jewish Renaissance, you are the expert in this field. As I just brought from the museum um, the book you wrote, it's called Rabbina Nechemia Anton Nobel, Die Jüdische Renaissance in Frankfurt am Main. Uh, you wrote this book in uh, 2005, and um, I will just also pass it around if you want, just uh, make sure in the end of the evening it will return to me. Um, you did really a field research on this rabbi, 
and you um, discovered texts and uh, you wrote that you couldn't find a lot because he didn't really leave scriptures. Um, so maybe you can tell us about this place, about this person, and about the so-called Jewish Renaissance. Uh, yeah, now? Yeah, okay. Yes, so I think this place, became uh, the Bernerplatz Synagogue became very famous because of Rabbi Nobel, because he was known for his charisma. He was a very charismatic figure, and uh, people who heard him, they remembered him many, many years afterwards. But I think before, I th I think before we talk about Nobel, we have to go back, because a little bit in history, because this... Even without Nobel, this synagogue is a symbol for, I would say, for many things. For one, for the first thing, it's a symbol in the end of the 19th century for Jews to remain um, loyal to the Jewish law. It was built in the 1880s because members of the Jewish community did want to stay within the Jewish community and still um, remain orthodox. The Jewish community was liberal in its majority, and in Frankfurt you had a community that had separated, the Samson Raphael Hirsch community, but there were enough um, uh, Jews in, this co in the Frankfurt Jewish community that said, we want to stay within a Jewish community together with liberals, liberal Jews, with liberal synagogues. We want to be on the same board, but we want to have an orthodox synagogue because you didn't have any more an, an orthodox synagogue. So it's a symbol for, uh, I wouldn't call it Renaissance, but I first would call it um, to remain stubborn or to, to stay and say, this is our heritage, this is our um, tradition, and we want to continue it. And this started with Markus Horowitz, with the first rabbi. Um, and um, when I say tradition or I say continuity, it's always in this context, it's always based on Jewish law. What's important is that you, are, you remain faithful to the Jewish law, what we call halacha. And um, this is the first symbol, I think, for this synagogue. And it's very important to know because it means that whatever you change or whatever you try to renew or you, whomever you try to uh, bring into the circle, it's on the, always on the basic of the Jewish law, of the orthodox Jewish faith in, in, faith in the orthodox understanding. And then, after Markus Horowitz died in 1910, um, Rabbi Nobel came to Frankfurt. He was his successor. And um, as I said, he was a very charismatic uh, rabbi. And um, he was also, and I think this is uh, very important also for the 19th, for the 20th century, for German Jewry before the Holocaust, before the Shoah, that they understood themselves as Jews and as Germans. That means that, and Germans, I don't mean in a nationalistic way, but I mean it in a way of, um, of uh, general values, of like what we call Deutsche Bildung, of education. And they wanted to have both, or they thought that both values have the same, um, the same right. The Jewish values and the general values have to go together. And um, this is an idea which then found its end uh, with the Shoah. That it, it showed that uh, the Germans did not uh, understand this the same way. And um, so Rabbi Nobel was one who was learned or who knew very well um, German. Uh, the, he had the uh, German education. All the rabbis, or most of the rabbis, then had a, uh, were studied at the university and had a, a PhD from a German university. And he was very well versed in um, in the Talmud and in in Jewish law. And uh, he even did his PhD on the theory of beauty at, Sch was Sch at Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer's Theorie des Schönen. So you see. It's, uh, he was very rabbis, philosophically... In rabbis would have degrees in uh, philosophy? Yes. I mean, but he was an outstanding figure. He was, uh, in this way, he was an exception. Most of the rabbis did their PhD in Oriental Studies, or, because there were no Jewish studies at the university at that time. So they did it on Bible and, oh, and right? And, the, te and the, what, what, the Testament, what's called the Old Testament, things like this. But he did it on, uh, on philosophy. 
And after he had been rabbi for a couple of years in small communities, he even went to Marburg, where there was a very famous German uh, philosopher, Cohen, Hermann Cohen, and he studied the year philosophy with him. And Hermann Cohen was a very liberal Jew, um, but he always defended the Jewish rights. So uh, this also shows you that uh, Nobel, but also the other rabbis, they didn't have, they didn't have any fear to uh, interact with, um, with Jews, with other, from other denominations, right? It's not that they say, oh, he's uh, not uh, Jewish enough, or he's not Orthodox, but they interacted. So, um, yes, and then when uh, Nobel, after the First World War, when he was here rabbi, and he was very charismatic in his sermons and his speeches, he brought together a, young gr a group of young Jewish intellectuals. And this we would call the Jewish Renaissance. Uh, people like Erich Fromm, Leo Löwenthal, um, Martin Buber, Nachum Glatzer, and Simon, Siegfried Krak Krakauer. Some of them later became very prominent members of the Frankfurt School, Frankfurter Schule, of the philosophical stream. And um, together, he wanted to bring them back to the Jewish sources. And he, for a couple of years, um, he succeeded. Um, Yes, the pr he died very young. He was only 50 and he died. So then after his death, uh, this uh, didn't continue, didn't go on. For so he time. didn't die in the Holocaust? No, no, no. He died in 1922, January 1922, very young, 50. Um, and then some of these intellectuals like Leo Löwenthal and Erich Fromm, they kept, kept for a while, like they kept a kosher household, which they didn't have before, and they kept uh, Shabbat uh, because... They said, you can read that they were so impressed by him that he, uh, Noble for them symbolized the totality of Judaism, that you can be an intellectual and a Jew. But then he died very young, so he didn't leave many scriptures, and most of the people just remember him in his speeches. I think now that's enough for the beginning, right? So um, if we say that this place here is a material place, so um, I have to ask then for the definition of the immaterial heritage connected to this place. And maybe we could fill it already a little bit with, um, with your uh, Jewish renaissance, what you explained to us. Um, Martin Buber was also part of this uh, group and of this Jüdische Lehrhaus, which then was established um, not as a place, as understood, but as an idea, um, doing lectures and groups, learning groups all over Frankfurt in different places. And Martin Buber um, said in 1923 that the Jewish Renaissance is a new creation from ancient material. So I'm still struggling with this uh, term Renaissance because it says to me that there was something dead, which had to be rebirthed again. Um, yeah, what would you answer to that? Yes, I would say that the Renaissance was uh, a way back to the sources that had been um, neglected uh, for many years or se for centuries uh, in Germany that uh, the German Jews were most of them assimilated, were on the path of assimilation, and uh, they didn't know their Jewish sources anymore. And um, like um, uh, Gershom Scholem or um, Leo Löwenthal, they came from very assimilated homes. And it's known that, for example, the grandfather of Leo Löwenthal was a school teacher in the, in the orthodox school of the separatist community, really ultra-orthodox, of Samson Raphael Hirsch. And his father had already abandoned, I mean, he stayed a Jew, but he had like abandoned the tradition. So Leo Löwenthal says that at their home on Yom Kippur, they had especially a very good meal. So like to say, you know, this is, uh, we don't need the tradition anymore. And uh, so um, I think many traditions were not lived. And, you know, or, or many know uh, the, the, that German household started um, to put a Christmas tree on Christmas, right? As a, it's a symbol of assimilation. And um, 
this on the one hand, and on the other hand, also the the study of Talmud was not really developed anymore in, in Germany. One of the dreams of Nobel was to put up here also a Talmud school, and he gave uh, Talmud lessons um, in the Freie Jüdisches Lehrhaus. So I think the Renaissance is the meaning that to bring back, and we talk about uh, the aim is Jews, it's not about... Um, uh, coexistence with the others, or it's not about to interest the non-Jews what is Jewish tradition. It's about the Jews to bring back the Jews to their tradition, but to bring it to bring them back in a way that fits modern life in contemporary times, and not like um, to say um, and to find the meaning of the old sources for them as they live. And this I would call the Renaissance that you try to combine your life conditions, your values, your general values, um, with the Jewish values by going back to the sources and by trying to live the tradition. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because um, it says, in fact, that this Jewish renaissance was in the people, not in the place. It was their renaissance, being Jewish, and not in, in a movement, maybe. Um, I would like to know, maybe of you, of you, what um, for you is an entangable heritage, an immaterial heritage. What do you understand with that? Mm. I think that, you know, being uh, dealing with performance, dealing with the, which is by definition immaterial, right? Like it's by definition something you cannot grasp. Um, and also hearing how you speak about uh, um, intellectuals or, or uh, thinkers that went away or even their families went away from the source and then they found a way back. I can really find myself in this. It's very, it's very, uh, um, it's very artsy. It's like very. It's like a very artist kind of egoistic thing. Like you see, you see yourself everywhere, or you project yourself everywhere. But I can really see myself in that. Um, and I think <clears throat> the the question of immaterial uh, uh, heritage. It's. It's for me definitely. Defines what I am doing now. I think. Um, or I, I try to go into, go closer. You know, you mentioned I'm doing my bar mitzvah, so I'm doing my bar mitzvah next year when I'm, when I'm going to be 40, because I haven't done it when I was a kid. Um, so I, I am going closer, but I don't know closer to what, really. Or, or, but there is, um, there is a deep intellectual curiosity, which is now, for the first time, also a, an affective curiosity. Like there is something really emotional and existential and spiritual. So I feel maybe there is something there which could um, get closer. And in a way, you know, we are thinking a lot also here these days about um, practices of archiving, right? Like we have these like boxes being opened and documented and cataloged and so on and so forth. Um, and in a way, doing, doing one's bar mitzvah, like le learning how to sing the parasha, learning how to use the tropes and to actually inscribe your body into the archive, um, th I think that's the definition of immaterial heritage somehow. Because it's your action or it's your voice or it's literally your body. And your body, of course, is material, but it is also immaterial. It's going to go away. Um, or it's ephemeral to a certain extent. Um, yeah. Oh, fortunately, do we really want to be here very long? I mean, um, but uh, yeah, I feel like these are. And then there is another, a whole other cloud of thoughts I have regarding uh, connecting to the question of love we addressed today and yesterday in our performance in our talk, where um, it is. A, uh, it's like a custom to, uh, to love or to pray or to, to direct yourself towards what you cannot perceive, uh, with whether it is a, you know, the spirit of God, the idea of God, the belief. So to, 
to direct oneself towards what you cannot fully grasp um, is something which I find very inspiring and, 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 and very challenging uh, and exciting. Also, like thinking about this crossroad of like being in a, in a position of coming back <laughs> to Jewish thinking and, uh, or Jewish practice um, and developing my own work at the same time. Or like, I have, it was a very long answer. I don't know if I answered any of the questions, but I have a lot of thoughts. I, if I may jump in there, I think, I think a, a central aspect to what you're doing here in doing your bar mitzvah is, is dealing with text. Yeah. You're learning the Torah, yeah. Arsha, Naso, mm -hmm. and in learning that text and learning to speak the text, the, spo the speaking itself is immaterial, no? Right. And you, you're, you have family heritage that's Ashkenazic, that's Yemeni, these are different Nusachs. Those are also immaterial heritage, no? These like different ways of sounding out the text and these different ways of, of, of framing the text in relation to other texts. And so it's always, there is always an intellectual aspect that's somewhere embedded into, into whatever the Jewish practice, I suppose. I mean, because it, you're always placing, it's comparative, it's a kind of comparative literature or it's a kind of comparative performance maybe. Mm -hmm. And I think the bar mitzvah is that. Yep. And I think that your performative work deals with that in some way and yeah. now like shifting to like, a Jewish orientation maybe yeah. is a kind of maybe it's a tshuva or something maybe I feel like I always I feel like also the other I think also the other work I did was it always had a Jewish orientation without even me knowing it but maybe that's too mystical but I do feel that there was also that in my work yeah, I mean I think that the kind of I think that the kind of dialogic aspect between different materials in your work owed something to a kind of to a kind of Jewish disposition yeah. or, or a Jewish critical disposition or a Judaic yeah. critical disposition maybe. Yeah. I think the idea of bar mitzvah is already immaterial, right? Yeah, I mean absolutely. you're doing your bar mitzvah, right? And yeah. you're not trying to to um, to come to Frankfurt and to buy some precious stone of the past or something, yeah. right? Yeah. But, so um, I think this is a modern way, right? Of yeah. Going back, as you said, to the text and yeah. going back to your uh, mm -hmm. material heritage, right? Yeah. And creating and also contributing to this immaterial heritage at the same time, or tr trying at least to contribute to it uh, in, in the way that we can. But yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's interesting that you chose Frankfurt for that. You're not living here, you're living in Berlin. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we are very honored. So you will do your bar mitzvah in the West End Synagogue, I will. which is an old synagogue, yeah. uh, survived the yeah. Shoah. Speaking of that, I had the most intense experience when I was here in uh, July, my first, uh, in a second visit. Um, and I was in the West End Synagogue in the, um, the service of Tisha B'Av. And it was the first time in my life that I attended. I, 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 I never, I've never done that before. Tisha B'Av is the the ninth of the month of Av. Uh, it's usually, I guess it's always in the summer, right? Yes. Like some, and that is the day. It's a, it's a mournful holiday. It's a fast. It's a fast day. And that's the day where uh, we commemorate the destruction of the temple. If I'm not wrong, both temples. We are commemorating the destruction of both temples. And the, the service, which I was very very lucky to attend, it was super small. We were in this huge synagogue in West End, which can have up to like a thousand people, and we were like 20 people. Um, sorry? I said, I know it. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Uh, and we were like 20 people, and it's very quiet. It's really, you feel the mournful. It's, uh, um, and everyone takes their shoes off, and you see it on the floor, you're not allowed, and you read uh, Megillat Eicha, which I have never read before. And I was floored. I was floored by the text. It's so horrific and beautiful at the same time. But I feel like what was really emotional for me, speaking of ephemeral or um, intangible heritage, we were sitting there in the one synagogue that survived, uh, the Kristallnacht, that survived the destruction, and we are uh, reciting psalms about the destruction of the temple. And that was just too much for me. It was like, it blew my, it was like, it was like really, it's like so intense. Um, 
and it was really special to do it in that place and to experience that experience for the first time in that place. That's why I'm also super happy that the bar mitzvah will happen there. Um. So um, maybe Rachel, you can help us out a little. Um, the people in the West End Synagogue um, praying with you there, they were not Jewish Frankfurters before. They didn't have roots in Frankfurt. So in the first years after the war, the Frankfurt community um, was built by people, survivors coming from the East. So maybe you can tell us a little about and also about um, the connection or not connection of, um, of these Jews to the Frankfurt Jewish history. Yes, the uh, Western Synagogue um, um, was the liberal synagogue. When we are speaking in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the Western Synagogue was um, built and, and opened, inaugurated in 1910. So you had the Berneplatz Synagogue, which was the, which within for the Jewish community was the big um, Orthodox synagogue. You had the main synagogue, the Haupt Synagogue, which was liberal. It's over there. Right. Like, right. A stone. There is no synagogue no. anymore. A right. A plaque. And you had the Western Synagogue because many Jews moved to the West. Um, you know, it's a, it's a known phenomenon all over the world that people, uh, the, the poor people are living in the East and the, end, in the East End. And I want to ask, why is it always the West End? So somebody told me it's because of the winds. Because, like, because you have the New York West and London West and yeah. Frankfurt West. And, and they said that in the West, the winds are better. So it's a better... That's, I don't know if this is a... But it's, a, it's definitely that you have the East and are more poor in cities. And the moment people do get uh, become more affluent, then they move to the West and they get better housing. So a portion of the Frankfurt Jews had moved to the West. So they built the Western Synagogue in 1910. And it was built as a liberal synagogue. And you can see it until today because there is still the organ. Also, we don't use it, but there is an organ. And also the organ today is not where it was before the war, but uh, it still remained. So this is the only um, sign that it um, uh, was an, or the visible sign that it was a uh, liberal synagogue. Um, yes, and it was the only synagogue, as you said, that was not destroyed during the war because it was too close to the uh, surrounding buildings. So the firefighters were afraid that the fire would go over to the housing. So this was not the synagogue was not destroyed. And of course, you had many little synagogues or places where, where Jews prayed because in Jewish understanding, a synagogue is not a holy place. It's not like a church. If you have a Torah and you have... Uh, uh, ten, according to the Orthodox, you have ten men who do, are the minion. Then you have a, you have like a public service. You don't need. Then it's like a synagogue. You don't need a building. But of course, they built synagogues, and this is the only one that remained. And after the war, there were no nearly no, there were no Frankfurt Jews. There were no Jews left in Frankfurt. Very few that were so. Uh, they were like. Um, saved by their Christian uh, wives, so that in the last um, uh, year as, um, were able to, to, to hide themselves. And Frankfurt was the center of the American army. So the Jews didn't come to Germany, they didn't come to Frankfurt, they came to the Americans. And uh, they came to the American army. Many of them lived in DP camps, like here outside Frankfurt, you have Tilesheim, which was a DP camp, a very big one. And some of them came also back to Frankfurt, not back, they came to Frankfurt. So they inaugurated the synagogue as an Orthodox synagogue because most of these people came from, were from all of them were from East Europe, survivors. And most of them were still raised Orthodox, traditionally. So this was the main, as they said, the main um, the basis. Like in an Orthodox uh, um, uh, ceremony, everybody can participate, even it's not if it's not according to liberal rules. But in a liberal service, the Orthodox would not participate. So since then, these, this uh, Western synagogue is an Orthodox synagogue. And when you talk, I was thinking when you spoke about uh, 20 people in the Western synagogue, Tisha B'Av, you meant 20 men. 20 men. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> because uh, this is the way it is. And, uh, and these people didn't have any connection to Frankfurt. As I said, they came to the American army. Uh, they stayed here because the Americans were here. Don't forget, until 1948 or 9, there was no Germany as a Bundesrepublik Deutschland. It wasn't existing. We had the American army in Frankfurt and the headquarter in the former uh, IG Farbenhaus, where the, um, today the university is. Mm. So they stayed it here, and they said, many Jews said, as long as the Americans are here, nothing will happen to the Jews in Germany. And, um, and they uh, rebuilt their tradition and the services according to the way they knew it from East Europe, as they know it, as they knew it from home. And only in the 50s, some of the Frankfurt Jews who survived by emigrating in the 30s to Palestine they came back to uh, Frankfurt. So you had some uh, Frankfurt Jews. One famous example is Paul Arnsberg, who was a historian of the Frankfurt Jews and who came here from, bef from Frankfurt before the war. But um, all, I would say, nearly all of the Jews were East European Jews. So, so they didn't have any connection also to Frankfurt uh, traditions. So it was a very small percentage of the original community that survived. Yes, very, very small. Mm -hmm. And most of them were... Um, from um, other places, from East Europe, yeah. or, the, or via, you know, East Europe, Israel, and then yeah. they came to Germany. And uh, you could see this also on the uh, conflict on the Bernerplatz. When the conflict about this um, uh, place erupted, the people protesting on the Bernerplatz, saying we have to save the remnants of the Frankfurt Jews, were mostly uh, children from... German Jews, not from Frankfurt Jews, but, but their parents and grandparents had been German Jews and they had emigrated to um, Palestine um, mm. before the war. And um, I would say my generation, that my parents are from East Europe, from Poland, and m most of the community, they said, uh, okay, so it's a ghetto, it's some ruins, okay? I mean, there have been so many places destroyed, so um, we don't have... Judaism is not about uh, keeping places. Yeah. Judaism is about keeping the spirit going yeah. on, right? Yeah. And, yeah. I have to say, that I, have, I, I think there's a, well, it's one of the most beautiful things I also can remember when my father would tell me about the synagogue, exactly in the same definition that you just did. We have 10 people, we have the book, Shalom al Israel, we have a synagogue. The church is uh, the goyim, the law, it's not us. Like, uh, to be impressed by buildings, it's not us, for sure. And, it's really, and, and I think that's one of the most beautiful things about coming together, because what we need is each other, right? Like, we don't need walls. Uh, and there is something very beautiful about it, but what's really interesting in the sense of, like, for me, in the sense of this ephemeral trajectories, uh, is that for me, as soon as I see the erasure, the intentional erasure, then I start to care. You know what I mean? Then I'm like, you know what? I actually do care about this building. Like, if you're going to come and try to, like, take it away from me, then all of a sudden, I care about it a lot. Right? And it's like, it's interesting. It's just psychologically, but maybe also it's a, it's a reaction to um, just be living in Germany and, like, realizing this very deep um, erasure and violence and racism that, that we all, of course, are an anti-Semitism, I mean. Um, which we are all aware of and, and experience. But it's interesting because it is within, I feel like within a, a Jewish conversation, it's definitely a dialogue. And, and I don't have um, an inclination there. No, but maybe it's because you feel when they raise something, they take it away the publicity of it. Yeah. You know, like the book you can take in privacy, right? The Torah. Yeah. That's, I would say like Orthodox Jews would say, okay, we take the Torah, we take yeah. the letter, we take the book. Yeah. And we don't need the others to acknowledge it, that yeah. we are here, right? Yeah. And when you speak about the building and you say, they raise my building and then I care, yeah. it's like they raise you being part of the public, right? Yes. But they, but they also, it's also kind of unkosher in a way, because they place a giant material thing on top of the immaterial heritage of violence that enacted the destruction of this temple, which is maybe... More I, and then and then it comes to and then it's a it's a question of it, it destroyed people. This was about the destruction of people or something. And so I, I wonder maybe what that has, uh, I mean, how that figures into this conversation. I mean, because I, I think it's kind of like, yeah, just placing the act of 
the act of obscuring a place or the act of, of, um, of covering a place that has a history of violence is a way of, yeah, I think it's just a way of erasing memory, a way erasing a possibility of a human connection. It is definitely a question of erasure, I think. And I think it's very true what you say, that it's about private and public. Because if we are just dealing with our own lives, then we're fine. But we've seen what happened when publicly there is no acknowledgement. And you know, I was just telling Sarah about it the other day. It's the next day, now in the summer, the next day after the service was Tisha B'Av, was the actual fasting holiday. So I'm still like walking around here with my m mournful energy and I feel the heaviness. Like it was very real. Um, and, all, and I was walking around town and I'm realizing that all over there's like little kids with like pride flags. And I'm like, okay, that's whatever. And then I realized that there was like the official CSD, like the pride parade from Frankfurt was on that day. And I'm like, I'm just like, I'm gonna go. Like, you know, I was like, what the, really? And that was amazing. And just speaking about erasure and, and public life, like how come no one thought about that? You know, the, and it's like, yeah, it's the same, it's the same kind of logic. And that is not, um, material thing. It's about um, cere ceremony, it's about timing, it's, it's, like the, it's not about space, it's about time and being sensitive to that. And it is about people and their, and their gestures. Um, but I think one feeds into the other. So also because of the having that experience, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm a gay Jew. So like I should be also part of the pride celebration. But on that day, I'm not. I'm not going to be part of the party now because I'm not, because it's not that day for me. So what are you telling me? That it's not for me, this party, right? Or that there is like, and there is no, and I mean, in, in, my, in my opinion at least, there can't be an equal, um, an equal amount of uh, sensitivity or an equal amount of consideration from the side of the German government or from the side of like bureaucracy in Frankfurt. I think that you have to prioritize uh, Jewish life over other stuff in, in that. I think... That's what you have to do. Like, that's not even a question. It's my radical opinion, but, uh, you know, obviously no one listens to it. But just to, like, feel, to feel that, to see this, like, to, to see that the, um, the destruction is ongoing. That's what I'm saying in so many words. So, Ethan, you did, um, you showed us a composition here on the first night. You did a sound installation. And you called it Zeitrem, which is um, from a Shabbat song. And uh, we, we sing um, to the angels. And um, yeah, they are leaving the place. They go out. So uh, when we could listen to your composition, you were not here. We, we couldn't see you. You were somewhere over there. Um, so why did you choose to be over there? And... Um, do you feel this place as a left place? As a left place. Left place. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know that I, that I feel it as, as left, but I think that absence is part of it, or that and departure is part of it. I think that also presence is part of it, and I think that that's what this, is, that th this moment is attesting to. Um, but I think I, I, felt, I felt like I wanted to do something that was really rooted in a, in a kind of, in a Judaic perspective, and, and a kind of, and enact the kind of Judaic practice that I'd, I wanted to be somehow separate, at least for me, in my mind, from like a staged performance that I might otherwise do in a, in a different setting. And so being off the stage and reading, I was actually, I, I just didn't specify to anyone, but I was over there in the corner and there was, there was a lot of light. And I mean, I think some people did come by and, and look from over there. But I think the main point was just, I'm gonna be over there reading and I'm gonna read aloud but kind of to myself also. And so I think it was just this question of pushing it off the stage and also letting the angels and the energies in this place do their work like in reaction to the sound. I don't know how they felt about it, but um, yeah. Um, your performance work today is called Rosh Hashanah 5782, so you refer to this year. And you called it on a politics of love. I have a nice one for you. Um, we are sitting here uh, in the layout, in the floor space of the Berneplatz synagogue. 
Um, as you maybe know, there we came in. There is the entrance. There we see the Aron HaKodesh, the um, Torah shrine. And somewhere over there, we heard and could listen to a speech of Rabbi Nobel, uh, given in 1912 on Yom Kippur. So, as you maybe know, in a few days we will have Yom Kippur. So, um, and we could listen to his uh, speech. And he was saying, the religion without love is a poor body from which the soul has escaped. And I was thinking about this when I walked with you today. So I would like to know uh, why you did a combination in your, in your performance um, with Rosh Hashanah and, um, yeah, with this year and a politics of love. So what is this, what is this group? Um, I think I can... This this one was the fourth, not consecutive, but it was the fourth Rosh Hashanah performance that I've made. I did one, I did, I did 2017, 19, 20, and now. Um, and each year I try to choose some aspect to, to focus on. Um, and in 2019, it was in conjunction with the piece I just premiered in Graz, which is called No Apocalypse, Not Now. So it was just it was just about visions of the apocalypse because it was focusing on how the end of the year and the beginning of the year is a time of ending of a world and an, a beginning of a new world. Um, last year it was about forgiveness as I was doing it in a Nazi cemetery. It was very complicated. It was very intense in Berlin. Um, and this year, I don't know how I landed on love. Maybe it's because I fell in love this year and I have a very beautiful relationship. Um, Maybe it's because of this text that I found from Hannah Arendt talking to James Baldwin. Um, and then when I, when I came across Sefer Ava from Rambam, it was already after we decided on it. So, so it wasn't because of that. I, honestly, I, can't, I don't remember what was the thought process. I'm really sorry. But... Uh, but I do feel that, um, or oh, maybe it's just this year that was so rough on everyone and they needed some comfort. Maybe it's that. Um, and then, yeah, but also, I was talking once to, um, I think it was when I spoke with uh, Rabbi Susan, with your husband, because he's working with me towards the bar mitzvah, and we had one of the... Um, in one conversation, he was asking me, what do you think is the most important pasuk, the most important verse in the Bible? And uh, I obviously didn't know uh, what I thought. But he said that some people say that um, the most important one is uh, uh, I don't know how to translate it, actually. Or what's the, but it's like, and you shall love your fellow as you love yourself. Or like it's, you, you give the same. So maybe it's also that. Like maybe it's also... I'm just, I'm just really trying to analyze now, not fully consciously, <laughs> but maybe it was also this year of getting closer to the sources, getting closer to the tradition has brought me closer to uh, wishing for formulating a politics of love. Because love is so central in the, in the practice of, of, of devotion. Then also it's connected to Rosh Hashanah in that regard. And I'm sure you will have something more to say about that. Uh, some, I guess to the point of 5782, I mean, this is a year of Shemitah, I mean, uh, yeah. technically speaking. And this is something that uh, I was very in, uh, thrilled to discover in the process of us yeah. studying. And I think it was, it, Shemitah was something that we spoke a lot about in Shavuot yes. this year. We, also yeah. did, did we, we had a show in Shavuot in, uh, in Berlin. Yeah, we did a Tikkun Lail, actually, the, the whole night. Yeah. And um, and we were speaking a lot about the Shemitah and, and thinking through it as like an image of how t of of a kind of love. I mean, it is a loving gesture, but it's also a commandment. It's like you're just supposed to do it. And Shemitah, Shemitah is the is the um, commandment to every seven. It's like on the seventh day of every week you rest. So on the seventh year you have to let uh, the land rest. 
So Shmita, the word means to let go or to drop or to yeah, lishmot, like to um and you have to and you have to let go and you're not allowed to make money. You like to work on the, the land, I mean yeah. the soil, right? Agriculture is not to be done uh, yeah. on Shmita. And uh, so that the, uh, the the land can rest as can well. Heal, right? yeah. Can heal, yeah. Can re heal, yeah. It's a very, if you want, it's a very a climate, uh, very ecological principle. Very ecological right? and also... Very, that's what I mean. There are many things yes. already yeah, I mean, it's ecological, it's also, right. communical, it's also communal, it's also communal, it's its relation to the stranger and to the orphan and to the widow who should yeah. who should live off this land also yeah. during that time. It's also against accumulation. It's also anti, it's right. counter-capitalistic. Right. Like you cannot just earn money endlessly. Right. Every six years, there must be a stop. There you also must have to let your slaves go. Yeah. I mean, right? right? right. If, slaves, if they choose to come back with you, then they should stay with you until the 50th right. year. Right, right. But they so have it gave you the time to study. So, yeah, um, yeah also not uh, working on the land. So people were going deeper uh, into their studies. Um, that was also a very spiritual um yeah, concept. it just it just occurs to me now. But at the very beginning of Corona was when Ariel and I began our practice of studying, uh, of doing the parsha, every doing week. weekly Shabbat weekly Shua. readings. Yeah. And so, and we've kept that up uh, basically to this point now. Yeah. And that was a sort of was a kind of, I don't know if that was a year of shemitah, but mm. something about release that was certainly part mm -hmm. of that time. I think. Yeah, you were forced to. Yeah behave somehow so it uh, like mm -hmm. the shemitah people were forced not to work on the land so yeah. but it has side effects yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, Ariel and Ethan are you part of a Jewish renaissance in Germany <laughs> I don't know I also like, don't know. I don't. I don't think it stops there. It's also not for us to but say. No, it's like probably not. someone else has to say it in a few, uh, in on another stage here, like in a, in a hundred years or something. <laughs> Maybe then they will they will talk about this panel. They will talk about the wonderful Misara Susan, who was charismatic and uh, yeah, and uh, and about yeah. I mean, but I, but I can say that I can say that. We just talked about it with Daphne before, my good friend Daphne is here, that um, I grew up very, I can totally relate to what you described about these intellectuals, because I grew up super non-religious. I grew up in Tel Aviv, um, and my interest, it was always there, but it was m maybe intellectual, maybe like very distant and cold. And after moving here, I started to feel the need. Um, so in a way, going to Germany was a Jewish renaissance in my life, personally. Um, I'm sure there are so many reasons and many other people can explain it way better than me because I'm sure I'm not the only one that experiences this, uh, this thing, which was very typical. Um, but yeah, maybe that's, that's how I can relate to the, to the, to the question on a very personal level. Um, whether we are part... I mean, Ethan always says that what we are doing, that it's like uh, that we have a performance art yeshiva. That's what he calls it, art shiva. shiva. Art shiva. <laughs> um, <laughs> so maybe that's our um, Freie Lehrschule. It's a new creation. <laughs> art shiva. It's not a renaissance. It's a Ex new exactly, yeah. exactly. But that's what I mean. It's <laughs> great. It's good to feel. I love feeling. I love Because I know we never invent anything. And I, I love feeling like being part of some kind of a lineage. Um, but also, also it's important for me to consider, um, also because of my heritage, uh, to consider the importance of non-European culture in Jewish life. Uh, Yemeni culture, East African culture, uh, North African culture, um, you know, obviously, all over the world. So in that sense, I feel like it, uh, it is a different... Like, I also feel I became much more Yemeni since I live in Germany <laughs> than I was before. Um, well, I, I think another 
thing that we might say here is, is problematize a bit further the question, the point of Renaissance, like this word. And it, we discussed the other day, uh, uh, we were talking the other day, the, uh, uh, Sarah and Ariel and myself, we were, we were speaking about how the term uh, links to a certain kind of thought process that is related to the Enlightenment, that's related to humanism, that's related to like a, a specific set of, of intellectual worldviews that are not necessarily Judaic in origin. Um, I, I would say not, actually. Um, perhaps con not super confidently so, but fairly <laughs> confidently so. I don't know. But I, I, I think that perhaps what we're doing is being a bit... I think we're, being, we're, we're, we're creating a kind of visibility around Judaic questions and around Judaic practices um, through through the this lens in, in which we operate of performance art and theater and music, but I mean I think this is this has been going on for a long time. I mean there's a, ma a magnificent modernist dancer like Baruch yeah. uh, Agadati, um, or the Tzadik record label of John Zorn as avant-garde uh, jazz in in New York that has been a, actually a site of collection of a bunch of different peoples, not only Jewish peoples, but uh, there's a lot of orthodox uh, radical music makers in that community. And I mean, th I think there's, there's a lot of examples of people who are dealing with um, uh, Jewish principles or Jewish texts uh, through their work, through a, like a kind of avant practice or a critical practice. And I think we're doing that too. We are doing yeah. that too, Yeah. in that sense. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we're doing a, Ju a Jewish renaissance, but we're doing some kind of a Jewish inquiry um, that is linked to an artistic practice, yeah. I think there's also the question, um, one step backwards, if um, a Jewish renaissance, so-called, is uh, currently taking place. I mean, that's also a question we, we didn't answer or maybe we cannot answer. Yeah. Um, in Germany specifically. In Germany spe yeah. specifically. I mean, yeah. we had this break. We had this uh, yeah. complete clash. We had uh, the Shoah, yeah. the... the um, absolute absence of love mm -hmm. and um, yeah so uh, the question is it's too early in my opinion and my uh, feelings it's too early to ask this question it's mm -hmm. only 70 years we can't say it's now it's a Jewish revival and uh, let's celebrate so mm. I want to come to the next point celebration uh, we have now in Germany 1,700 years of Jewish life in Germany. There was no Germany then, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, in, in this land, what, what is today Germany. And um, we have many celebrations and we have many lectures and movies and concerts. Um, yeah, in a very happy way. Um, doing this, uh, this, uh, this 1,700 years. Um, I'm not so happy about, I'm not so happy with it. What are your, um, what are your sides on this, your views? Um, I think I'm not, I don't know, I don't think I'm happy about the celebrations, but I think the, uh, what I think is the right way is the intention to show that uh, Jewish life is not only Jewish destruction or the destruction yeah. of Jews. And in Germany, you always say the Germans love dead Jews, not living yeah, Jews. Yeah, yeah, we just talked so, about that. So, you know, it's yeah. Um, yeah. a bon mot. <laughs> so I think uh, what's important is to show that for many centuries, uh, German, uh, Jews in Germany were mm. uh, part of the regular mm. life. And of course, there have been... Uh, um, uh, pogroms and destructions, and mm -hmm. they were driven out of towns, and um, and there was the Shoah. But, uh, there are also 800-year-old graves right over yes, there. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. But they were always part of yeah. the German. I th that's why I think it's important mm -hmm. um, to give to have another focus, mm -hmm. not always to have only the focus on. Uh, you know, you have in Germany, you have a lot of. Uh, now I think you have a lot of memorial days, or especially in Frankfurt, you have a lot of memorial ceremonies, right? Okay. You have the 9th of November, you have the, inter the, um, the, and the Germany also, not only the 9th of November for the um, November pogrom, but they also adopted the International Shoah Day in mm. January, the 27th of January. So the Bundestag is always having a, 
um, a memory hour and somebody important is speaking um, and telling um, about the Shoah. So I think the in um, in the impression is that uh, Jews are only connected as um, yeah. uh, being uh, persecuted. Yeah. And uh, as I said, it's that Jews. So I think it's very important to show that Jews have been uh, um, part, but also in things that you don't remember, that you don't know today. That, for example, here in Hessen, they have been, um, they were living in the countryside and were uh, selling cattle. The the, Hes the Jews in Hessen were known for uh, were m most of the people who sold cattle, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, huh? were Jews, right? That was a Jews. So there you have many Yiddish words also being used because of this uh -huh. in the trade. And I think these are aspects, for example, that are totally forgotten. And uh, this is a chance to bring it back yeah. by having such a year. I feel like I, I, I totally can relate to this. And I, again, I, I don't have the knowledge, but I can say something about um, relation or like how I feel from, from living here and, 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 and learning how people see Jews. It's, I think you're 100% right. Um, they mostly see us as like being destroyed or prosecuted and so on. But I also share your um, this discomfort with it. But I think for me, the discomfort comes from the fact that there is still... Um, a sense of n not really being accountable because what they don't understand if I may do also this they and us, this us and them, which is so actually counterproductive. And it's also just not true. What they don't understand or don't realize is that being in relation to the Jews also defined who they are. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. That's the thing. It's like, and that's like, that's something that. Uh, good liberal Europeans still are not understanding about racism and about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is called the oldest hate, right? This, this, this much we know. What defined Europe, it's like what defined Europe, definitely modern Europe, is to a very strong degree uh, colonialism and their expansion towards other places. They, they meet people who are not white, so then they have to decide, oh, now we are white. These things historically are linked. It's the same thing with Jews and non-Jews. And this is something that they still can't understand. It's not that Jews had life here. Jews had life here with Germans. Germans defined themselves in front of the Jews. That, that was always this kind of um, back and forth. And this, I feel, has never been really addressed or acknowledged in discourse. Maybe it's like... Uh, Maybe we are still ahead of them, and they we have, we have to catch up, like always. But uh, and in fact, the word Jews or Jewish is not the word that that uh, Jews use to to refer to themselves. I mean, this is a term that emerges in a European discourse, no? And it's like it's we're we're uh, Am Israel, we're the people Israel. It's like it's a different. It's like also a different conception, like to place this, like this question of the anti-Semite also and the Jew. I mean, yeah. I think Sartre says that, that the anti-Semite doesn't need the Jew. To be anti-Semitic, yeah, yeah, which is interesting, no? So it's like the 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 disposition of hatred is going out, and that same disposition of hatred that's going out and projecting is perhaps part of the same space. Like you were speaking, we were speaking today that that love. Uh, we were quoting uh, James Baldwin, and and Ariel was pointing out that that love and hate are emerging from the same place, that they're not in a dialectical relation, but are actually part of a big mess. That is the self, no? Yeah. And exactly. I think that and I think that this kind of situation speaks to that, that, that these projections onto a group of people or these like statements onto a group of people who have a set of different practices are deaths. Those are all deaths. Yeah. Those are all still images. Yeah. And uh, and what that group of people are doing or how they are referring to themselves. I mean I think this is this is this kind of questioning, this questioning about like how a minority group is operating and, and what kind of agency they have to define themselves is very much so part of a broad political conversation at the moment, certainly in the United States with, with the African American well, community, but, yeah. but with, all, with all measure of communities that are, that are different from, the, from a white mainstream. Yeah, and so, but so many of these conversations fall under the, um, under the terminology of identity politics, and which is at the end of the day liberal and it's only one version or one possibility. Maybe it's time, I don't know how to do that, I'm not a professional, but maybe it is time to start to think historically about a different way of making histories. Because the only way that at the moment we know how to do it is to say, okay, 1700 years of Jews. This is that, th this, what are Jews? It's this. It's a very German way of doing stuff, no? But actually, 
Jews were part of German society. In the, the entanglements are super complicated, and this is something which I feel is very hard to 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 communicate. Something which is very hard even to, to oneself to understand. But this is the aim, and that's how yeah. I understand the aim of the yeah. aim of this thousand seven hundred years. I mean, you always need. I think in politics, you always something, need some yeah. uh, uh, name. Yeah. So that you get money, you get yeah. funds, you know, yeah. that you can do. I mean, you should do it uh, without a special year, right? I mean, you yeah. should do it. I mean, and there have been many. Exactly, but that's There have I'm been saying. for many years um, commissions who said that uh, now you have to learn more about Jewish history in schools and not only about the Holocaust. And there is a Leo Beck Institute uh, in, there are in, not in Germany, but there are friends of the Leo Beck Institute who have done a lot for uh, publishing, uh, on helping publishing school books to, uh, to show uh, how you can integrate Jewish history yeah. into the German history, yeah. right? Yeah. But I think, as I said, you need a year, you need something, and then mm. the money comes, and then yeah. they have all kinds of projects. And yeah. uh, many institutions do projects, and also in little towns and villages. So this mm. is maybe one of the... Yeah. Um, be like a possibility right, to... Mm -hmm. right. That's what I think. So um, I get also signs to hurry up a little bit. <laughs> I mean, we started later, so... Um, <laughs> And we are scheduled What's till the seven thirty. But What's okay. The time? Um yeah. Is it seven thirty? Yeah, it's seven twenty. So okay. uh be Okay, we're good. Um yeah. I want to um pass over the opportunity to you as the audience. If you have questions, um just come here and take a microphone and ask your question. Okay, Jean is uh is managing it. So just give a sign and uh, call her. Nobody. We were so oh. clear. Yeah. Wow. Okay. They're just fantastic. shy. Okay, fantastic. So <laughs> I will just close now with another quote from Buba. And um, he said... The shine of a new beauty is poured out over our days. He said in 1900, and he for surely referred to his days. But um, I would like to put a question mark after it and maybe to transfer it to our days. So maybe, Bikarov <laughs> Biyamenu, we have um, a new beauty here poured out. Um, if there is already a sort of Jewish renaissance happening or not, I think we can't answer that. We will leave that open. And I thank you very, very much. And I think um, we are a fantastic group. And I hope we will just stay in touch. And here we will go on now with a um, little concert. So maybe we have a few minutes to get a drink, quick. Yeah, and then uh, we just gather here. So thank you very, very much. Thank you and thank you, lots Sarah. of love. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everyone.